And good evening to everybody. This is Maternity and Midwifery Hour, and this is our 13th episode, and it's the last of this series. So I should hear from everyone going, oh, that's a shame, but we're going to have a little break because Easter's coming, and, and we've been going for a, a quite a few weeks, 13 weeks. So um, just to say, my name's Sue MacDonald, and I'm the curator for this, the Maternity and Midwifery Hour, and also the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals. And it's my delight to be chairing this evening's session. And I've got two lovely, lovely speakers. I always have lovely speakers, and <laughs> this today is no exception. So we have Pfizer Raymond. Now, is it Ryman or Raymond? It's Rahman. Rahman, you see, I've been corrected. Pfizer Rahman and Maddie McMahon. Is that correct, Maddie? <laughs> it is. Oh, well that's done. a relief. And of course, what we do to our guests is always put them on the spot and ask them for a little moment of the week to share with us. So I'll start with Maddie, if I might, for a moment of the week. Okay, so um, my moment of this week is the massive endorphin rush. I got getting in the sea. <gasps> oh, nice. I swim year round and um, it's amazing. And this week I managed to get in very early in the morning just as the sun was rising. Um, and it really does set you up for the rest of the day. Wow. Well, you're a very good advert for this early morning. <laughs> now, is this wild swimming or is it just, just cold water swimming? Yeah, yeah, I live at the seaside, so I'm really lucky. Wow, fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing that. I don't think I'll be joining you in a, a cold water <laughs> swim. I do my running in the morning, but I think a cold water swim would be too much for me just now. Thank you for that. Now, how about Pfizer? Um, my moment of the week would be um, supporting my sister in her breastfeeding journey where we've got one step closer to her getting closer to a goal to feed her baby. And we've had a really tough first three weeks and we found a fantastic lactation consultant who's helped us find a bit of a solution. So that is my moment of the week that my sister is getting one step closer to where she she wants to be. Well, your sister and the baby. And the well, baby. The Absolutely. together. Absolutely. You're right. Fabulous. Yeah, that's so special and and thank you for sharing that it's a very special moment and it is a very important moment we were actually having a discussion about breastfeeding and and the things before we all came online so thank you for that Pfizer now I'm just going to just go through a few things before we start with the the main event this evening and just and uh, say another welcome and remembering that this maternity hour started at the beginning of the pandemic and we're now in our third year I can't believe it it's three years but this is the beginning of the third year and it was really as a way of midwives getting um, midwives to be able to connect to get information and continuing professional development in easy digestible bits because mm. it was a time where we couldn't meet uh, face to face so this has been a really good um, part of the what we've been doing and it's been supported by Matflix and it's all free to attend and it's all recorded so if you're a midwife doing an assignment or doing a revalidation or you're a student and you've got another little assignment to do have a look at the Matflix because there it's all there and you've got lots and lots of material and you can access it for free and you can share it we love you to share with your colleagues because this is again a way of connecting with other people and being able to discuss really important issues together so do share now I will say a big thank you to everybody our NHS colleagues and outside the NHS and I think because um, we're, we're talking this evening about our friends and other people we work with in the NHS that that's very timely um, and we know that this that, that COVID is still around, it's still causing illness and unwellness uh, amongst the working, working midwives and staff, as well as the women and as well as our families. So I'll just say a big thank you to everyone who's covering gaps from people being poorly and a big thank you to people who are working so hard and also get well soon anyone who's poorly. Um, because it's even though people are saying it's not as bad as it was, it, if you've got it, it's pretty unpleasant so get well soon anyone who's got the covid 
Um, and people are very tired and stressed. And I think it's gone on for such a long time. We need to all look after ourselves as much as we can. So I'm going to remind you to do that. And of course, I'll have to show you my favourite calendar, which is now April. This is the April Action for Happiness um, calendar. And today it's the sixth. So it's do a body scan meditation and really notice how your body feels. This lovely calendar, you have something to do every day, which really focuses on not your work, not balancing all and juggling your all your family and your household and everything else but it just gets you to think about you and what you're doing and what you're thinking about and there's lots of really interesting things I'm, I'm going to get distracted if I'm not very careful so I'll move that away um, now just a little on the news as I always do um, it's UN International Day of Sport for the Development of Peace and how relevant is that now especially the peace bit of it with all the things that are going on in the world. Um, tomorrow is World Health Day. That's a good thing to, for us to think about. And also, uh, I noticed on Twitter, and those of you who know me will know I'm a, a little bit obsessive about Twitter. It's five times more April Advocacy Month. And they're asking people to write and to their MPs to really sign up for the... Um, to the five times more to reduce maternal mortality and, and, and sign up to the uh, pledge. So have a look at that. And we put the links for all of these things that I'm talking about on the resources sheet so you can get access to all of these things. Now, still in the news is the Ockenden report. It's published, it was published last week, huge review. And again, I've put the links on the resources page, but beware, don't press to print immediately because it's 250 pages long. It's a big report. Let me show you. I've got it by the side of me. Here it is. You can see I'm reading it because I've got little flags in it and it's quite thick. There, see how thick it is. It's, it's well, well worth reading and you really do need to read it, but I would suggest that you read first of all the executive summary, then the learning points, and then go through it steadily and really absorb what is being said because it's really important that we absorb this to change our practices to look at what we're doing for women and their families really critically um, and this was this review at Shrewsbury and Telford hospitals into maternity services looking at a lot of cases a lot of incidents and really listening to families a very important uh, review for us to take note of Take it easy reading it, though. It is a big document. I'm working through it myself. Um, and a friend of mine said to me, well, could, this couldn't happen in my unit. This would never happen in my unit. Have a look at it. Think about, has this happened in my unit? Well, could this happen? Do we always talk to women? Do we always listen to what they have to say? If something goes wrong, do you spend time listening to the parents, listening to the mum and how she feels about it and explaining what happened, why it happened and being very honest because that was a very big part of this report. People not necessarily being honest and it might be for the best purposes, but I'm not sure it was. A lot of systematic problems within the, the trust that needs to be addressed um, and the issues about having a robust and funded maternity-wide workforce plan. And I think that's something that's really important. But above all, and I said this last week and I'll say it again, the need to listen, to listen to women and their families and what they're saying. I think sometimes if we're busy, you, you don't always listen fully. You hear half of it, you don't hear all of it. And we need to tune into that. So I'm gonna leave that as homework for the next couple of weeks while we're away. That's your homework. And of course, most news, news at the moment is blotted out of it, just horrendous events in Ukraine um, with the Russian invasion and the murders of civilians in Bucha. I mean, there's a lot of horrible things going on in the world, but this is really our focus at the moment in the news. And we, I, I send my personal love and, and support for our Ukrainian friends, the midwives who are there looking after women and babies. Women and babies are still caught up in this though some have come out, obviously, and we pray for peace. And after that, thinking about um, what we can do ourselves and thinking about what we, we can offer to our 
colleagues and friends around the world. Change of pace now. I feel as though I've chased through that really quickly, um, but we need to move on to our maternity hour uh, content. Um, we're looking this evening at improving choices in care for women, working with friends, supporters and colleagues. And it's important we, we listen and work with women. And our speakers tonight are those who work very closely with women and families and midwives. And I'm really pleased to welcome them here tonight with us. So I'm going to start off and I'm pleased, delighted to introduce Maddie McMahon. She's a doula and a doula, two doulas. She says birth is the start of everything. And isn't she just right? The way we birth is the start of nurturing families and a healthy society. And her doula journey started in her own childhood and then in earnest when she did a Paramana doula course. Now, she's going to have to tell me what that is <laughs> with Michelle O'Donnell in 2003. She's a birth and postnatal doula, a doula course leader, a DD specialist companion and registered ABM breastfeeding counsellor. And I think she's going to share a little bit of what she does. So welcome, Maddie. The screen is now yours. Thank you, Sue. Hi, everyone. Yes, my name is Maddie, um, and I'm really honoured and happy to be asked to be here tonight. Um, as Sue said, I'm a doula um, and a childbirth educator. I've been doing this for nearly 20 years, um, and I've been a breastfeeding counsellor for nearly as long. I'm also the founder of two breastfeeding related charities. And I'm on the editorial board of the Practicing Midwife Journal. Um, and the reason for that is because I have a particular interest as a doula in how doulas and midwives can work together. So I've also been running a doula training course for nearly 15 years now. So my daily work is with parents at all stages of their journey from newly pregnant to years down the line when they step into doula work. Most of my working life is taken up by listening to stories of birth and parenting. I also support quite a lot of midwives as they change direction and become doulas and lots of doulas as they transition into midwives. So I, I get to listen to a lot of their experiences too. So because I've been a doula for a long time, I'm well aware that some midwives believe we have a strange approach. Maybe some think that doulas regard medical intervention as, um, as an evil, or they see doulas as an expensive luxury. There might be a little bit of awareness of the long-term relationship we build with our clients or the commitment we make to stay with them, however long the labour. A doula's work is mother work, wakeful nights, housework, long hours listening to the anxieties of new parents. It's pregnancy or postpartum peer support, similar in nature to breastfeeding peer support. Yet, in some conversations I have with mid midwives, I sense their fear of doulas overstepping the boundaries or encouraging parents to disengage from medical care. Sometimes, as I hold a woman in the throes of hard labour, stroke her hair or provide much needed sustenance, a midwife whispers that she wishes she could care for couples like that. I've always put quite a lot of effort into trying to debunk some of these assumptions because I've been lucky enough to experience the magic that happens when midwives and doulas create a loving and collaborative team around the family that they're serving. When midwives understand the intimate relationship between doulas and the families, they can join the team safe in the knowledge that everyone understands their role and their boundaries. Rather than feeling obliged to assert power and authority, a midwife can be part of the beautiful dance around the birthing person. I think doulas can be useful. We often represent women's voices on maternity voices partnerships and feedback on how we see services being delivered. 
doulas witness the care delivered by different members of staff. And we might notice inconsistencies or areas where savings or efficiencies could be achieved. We see service provision through the eyes of the end user and often take note of little things that staff might miss. Standing outside the system, doulas can also stand up against threats to midwifery, against bullying, poor care or human rights abuses without fear of reprisal. And doulas come from the communities that midwives serve. We were that young mother, that woman with postnatal depression, that parent who lost a baby, that parent from all the cultural and racial groups in your area. We can be communication conduits, enhancing the relationship between families and midwives. Increasingly, we're working under the auspices of agencies like Children's Services, Children's Services who recognize that because of our lay role, families often engage with us in a way that they don't with people who wear badges. Midwives have no greater fans than doulas. We see you up close and personal. We see when you have concerns or are tired, and we see how the systems you work within can cause you suffering. What we realise very quickly is that when midwives feel happy and supported, when you are not doing the job of two members of staff, when you feel free to practice in the way you were taught to, and when you have the chance to build relationships with families, birth is safer and more satisfying for all of us. My granddad used to say, use the phrase, on their uppers, when he encountered someone who was suffering. I never really understood what it meant until I learned that he was referring to the upper part of a shoe. Sometimes in life, we have so few resources or support that we have to wear the same pair of shoes for too long. Too many midwives I meet don't just have holes in their souls. Their souls have disappeared entirely. Too many midwives are walking barefoot through each shift without comfort and protection. And this situation is not sustainable. It was back in October on a Sunday morning that four of us doulas were lying in bed talking on Facebook Messenger. We were at our wits end. All of us had clients who were either not getting the clinical care they needed or were trying to navigate through multiple decisions around interventions they didn't feel sure they needed. All our clients felt manipulated along a conveyor belt and all felt the lack of psychosocial support from the NHS. With staff leaving, services being scrapped and whole units regularly closing, it felt like the whole system was on the verge of collapse. We got, began talking about the incontrovertible link between staff working conditions and our clients' birthing conditions. Things were so bad, we felt we needed to do something. Something that would remind midwives that someone cares. Something that could provide them with an outlet, a place to cry and call for change, and a place to build connection and community. Within a few minutes, we'd set up a Facebook group and invited a bunch of people. Within hours, the group had hundreds of parents and midwives streaming in. Within days, it was thousands. Currently, the group contains 22,000 people. We gathered some midwives to join our steering group. We're now a diverse mix of doulas, NHS midwives, and midwives working independently from a variety of cultural backgrounds. We wanted our group to reflect the diverse nature of the March with Midwives community. We wrote a manifesto, 
focusing in on the short list of things we felt could be implemented immediately to solve the crisis. Our demands fall under four simple headings. To listen to all staff and service users and their advocates. To fund emergency retention. To enable anybody willing to work or train to do so. And to reduce the demands on staff. We decided to hold vigils around the country. A vigil is a gathering usually formed in grief. And we thought that that was most appropriate. Despite the management of many trusts, discouraging or even forbidding staff to attend, on the 21st of November, 2021, we had 72 vigils around the country. And we estimate that around 12,000 people attended. That day was emotional. I don't think many of us anticipated the full force of the feelings that would be released as we stood shoulder to shoulder in the streets. Midwives told us that they were feeling hope for the first time in years. They told us what a difference it made, realising they weren't alone, realising that the system has been gaslighting them, blaming them for just not being resilient enough. Since November, we've been trying to leverage the impact the vigils had. We got a lot of press coverage, and we do believe that March with Midwives has played a part in putting maternity care on the government agenda. We have talked with ministers and been invited to sit at tables with senior figures. But what is most important to us is that this remains a grassroots campaign our role is to be a conduit for the voices of the parents and the midwives in our group. We aim to amplify their wants and needs and to provide a community where people can feel less alone and lonely. The Ockerden Report calls on us to listen. I think we have to peel down through the layers of what this means because it doesn't just mean listening to the families you are serving. It means really actively listening to each other. When was the last time you had a chance to sit in a room with a cuppa and talk to your fellow midwives without time constraints? Management needs to build in these opportunities. It also means listening to everyone else who may have a useful piece of the jigsaw puzzle. The grandparents, the aunties, the doulas, the antenatal teachers, the breastfeeding counsellors. We all have perspectives and suggestions that might be useful. We all share the same aim, to safeguard the physical and emotional safety of women and birthing people. This means we can't ignore anyone's voice because until we really start actively listening to each other without judgment, we will not find the key that will unlock this puzzle. We will have no hope of providing individualized, culturally safe care. There is so much that threatens safe birth and holistic family-centered midwifery right now. It seems to me that it's crucial that we find our common ground and lift our voices together. Because together, we can be very, very loud indeed. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. That's <laughs> being loud. <laughs> Except you're very peaceful and, and gentle with your presentation. Thank you, Maddie. I, and I think what's what's um, I just flicked through my my phone just to see the pictures of that march because I, w when you you sort of reminded me of how powerful it was, and I felt as though there were more than the thousands that you've suggested because we were there with people behind us, kind of who couldn't be there but were with us in spirit mm -hmm. so thank you for reminding us of that moment now anyone in the audience who has a question for maddie 
you can put, put it into the live chat and it'll come through to me. And I'm looking over here because having two screens, I'm very lucky, the, the questions will come here to me and I shall field them to Maddie and Pfizer. So without further ado, I'm now going to introduce Pfizer Rahman, midwife and founder of Raham Project. She was born and raised in the UK in a tight knit South Asian family and the mother of two young children and a qualified midwife as well. So she's used to doing the juggling as well, <laughs> like all of us. And she's been practicing since 2011. She's hugely passionate, and you'll see, about all things midwifery and ensuring we care for families. So they emerge from the birth, both physically and emotionally safe. This passion drove her to start a grassroots organization, the Raham Project, a platform to support families from diverse ethnic backgrounds and she's going to share with us some of those that work with us this evening so welcome Pfizer the screen thank is now yours thank you so much Sue I'm just going to share my screen with everybody so I just want to start by saying thank you for having me on here and Maddie I feel like you should create a hypnobirthing audio or <laughs> some kind of audio with your voiceover and we should get all staff to listen to it <laughs> so um, I'm going to be talking today about Rahan Project which is something very, very dear to me. Um, so I wanted to share what we've been doing with that platform with you all. So I'm going to initially go through a little bit of an introduction of um, who we are, what our aims are, and just a few more interesting details. So this is our second annual report that shows the activities that we've carried out in Raham Project um, between April 21 and March 22. So we're a grassroots organisation and we began in July 2020 and I am very excited to share that, you know, in August we registered as a community interest company formally and this was a really big step for me because I'm not a business person by nature, um, I am a midwife by nature and I've had a, a steep learning curve through doing all of this but it was something that my community really needed um, and I felt like this, this would really help them so that's why we did what we did. Um, what are our aims? So this is going to look a little bit about what our aims are. So Raham Project's aims are to create a safe space that's non-judgmental, particularly for mothers and partners from ethnic backgrounds. We want to start creating a space where things represent our communities a little bit more. So we've started creating digital media content around the perinatal period where we use key messages and images representative of people from within our communities in a very kind of easy to understand way. Um, and with this, what I found is actually lots of people are accessing it, not just necessarily people from our ethnic communities. There's lots of mothers from, you know, Caucasian communities who come and tell us, you know, nobody told us that. I wish I'd known that before. So I feel like it's spreading wider than I was planning, which is always a positive. Creating a support network is really key for us. So something that we started doing a couple of months ago was we created our own Facebook group. That's a private Facebook group run by mothers from ethnic communities for mothers from ethnic communities. Rahm Project actually started during COVID. So social media was our way to connect with families. And obviously it, it was something that clearly was needed. So we've continued to grow. Awareness, we're trying to raise awareness about the perinatal period. We really want to, you know, focus on maternal mental well-being. And I'm a huge believer that we could prevent a lot of the trauma that our families are suffering mm. through good education, really good uh, support during their pregnancies. And I feel like, um, you know, we can help help with that. Another aspect to that is raising cultural awareness training for healthcare professionals. So it's not just about looking at how we can support people um, who are having babies. It's also about making sure that the people who are providing the service are also mindful and aware of the nuances that people within my cultures face. So it's bringing both of them together. I think that's really, really important for me. And I guess that puts me in a really valuable position being a midwife who sees how the services work and also being somebody who's grown up within my local community and I've known how my communities have networked and they've taught me their ways of life. So I think marrying them two would be really powerful for a lot of families out there. All of the information that we gather together um, from Raham Project, we use that to feed back to our local maternity neonatal system. And that helps them try to, you know, shape our local services, which I think is really important that we have our voices raised in a way that we can start you know, creating real change in a system for them. 
And something that's come a little bit later down the line for us is advocacy. Um, and I think this is a really key, key thing for us, actually, when families come to us and they engage with us. It's about understanding that culturally, often there's a lot more handholding required. So that can be simple things like reconnecting them to maternity services, you know, supporting them, raise their concerns, sitting there and listening to them. If they really asked and they wanted us to turn up to an appointment with them, we would. But we have a key aim of making sure we're, we're closing this loop. Maternity services have the power because they are the biggest organisations that provide maternity care to families. So they need to understand that there are service users who have a need and if they're not feeling comfortable speaking up for themselves then they've got other people like us to help support them but it's really important that they're listened to so how have we achieved the aim so I've probably mentioned a few of these already social media is a really big way that we kind of target our communities um, and some of the things we've started doing with our digital resources is we're trying to make them um, more um, more reachable by creating them in languages that our local community understands. So Mibri and Urdu are two very commonly spoken languages within our Peterborough-based community. So we have started using that. And I'm hoping that as time progresses, that our longer term goal would be looking at, you know, securing funding so that we can start doing that in other languages, which would be really, really, really good, I think. Our listening events um, are offered every month. So we consistently offer an online listening session to mothers that wish to join and share their maternity care experiences in a safe and non-judgmental space. Um, and we promote them every month for families to join. And as we've consistently stayed there, I think we've developed this trusting relationship and people are beginning to hear about us and people are coming to join and share their experiences with us. Signposting and advocating for families has become a very important thing, like I said, about raising their um, concerns and their voices and making sure that they have that support there to be able to share what they're feeling. And I've already mentioned the um, Facebook peer support group. Now, this is just some interesting information about our social media. So we've had like a 50% growth in the last year, which means lots of people have started following us and accessing us. And these are some of the, the info, infographics that we've created in recent times. And these are some of the ones that people really have wanted to see more kind of content in this sort of format. I want to say thank you to all of the other organizations that are out there and have supported us in our social kind of world and shared our content. And since January, when we started creating these more um, like more representative uh, infographics, we've had lots of organizations come to us to ask to use these in mm -hmm. their hospital areas or their birthing centers. And I think it'd be fantastic if, if they could be shared as widely as possible, because we need we need this sort of information out there for families and also for staff to have as well, because a lot of the people that come to us are actually midwives who have just qualified or student midwives. I'm going to skip all the way down now um, just to our listening events, which I think are really um, important. If anybody wants to see the rest of this um, report, you can find it. Um, as our pin post on our Facebook page on Raham Project. And the couple of slides that we've just skipped through talk about the kind of information we've created. So I'm just gonna, like I said, skip through then go straight to our listening events. This is um, something that we do every month and we've hosted eight in the last year and we've had about 20 people turn, turn up to them and share their stories. And every single mum that comes to us, we offer them all one-to-one -one support if they want to sit and have a chat afterwards or if they want to just debrief about anything or if they want any extra support, any signposting, any connecting, we ensure that we're there for them. And a lot of mothers who have come to us have often said, I would quite like to talk to somebody about what happened to me because, you know, I feel maybe it wasn't right or maybe I want a debrief or that is a good outcome for us because I don't think um, ethnic minority women's or uh, women's and families' voices are well are, are, are not collected very well from hospital kind of feedback forms and I think there's lots of reasons for that but it's not happening as well as it could be so I'm really grateful that a lot of these mums are feeling brave enough to speak out about them 
And this then brings me on to some of the feedback that families have given us. So I'm just going to go through a couple of the stories that they've shared with us. Um, I won't go through them all because there's quite a lot on there. So you can feel free to go through them kind of in your own um, time. And these are mothers from all over the UK, although we're based in Peterborough and a lot of the stories are from around Peterborough, Cambridgeshire area. We've ended up connecting with mums from Leicester, Birmingham, uh, Nottingham, Newcastle. So it's been really amazing how many mums have caught on to the fact that, you know, we can come and speak here and we feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the mums who shared her story with us. With my first baby's labour, I felt anxious. I was in pain and screaming. The midwife was sniggering and making fun of me, saying, what will you be like during your actual birth? Staff who came in saw my headscarf and kept asking, do you speak English and do you understand what I'm saying? If they made an effort to glance at my notes, they would have seen I didn't need a translator. The doctor came in as I was half dressed and not wearing my hijab. He just knocked and then barged in. I called out to say just a minute, but he didn't wait. And this is one story of many stories that we hear. And actually, a lot of the common themes are feeling unsupported, feeling unheard, feeling like they were being judged or discriminated because of the way that they, they looked. Um, particularly, I've heard a lot from women who wear hijabs, actually, that there's not this awareness about, you know, how important modesty is for, for this, this community who chooses to wear a hijab. And so I think there needs to be a bit more awareness from service providers about these sort of things that are very important to these families. We often hear our families talk about how we would have preferred a female practitioner. Um, and some have been mocked by staff about this, the NHS, you don't get to choose that kind of stuff in our country. And to be fair, that's slightly racist as well. This is everyone's country. But a lot of themes have come up that I, I sat and I've listened to and realized that more needs to be done for our services. So I feel like, you know, in the wake of the Ockenden report, and in what March with Midwife that Maddie was speaking about have been saying, because essentially there's a lot of crossover with both those things. I think the key fundamentals are we need to listen to the service users and we need to nurture them and nurture the people that care for them. It's about bringing both of these things together. And so I'm going to scroll past the rest of the stories. There's about, I want to say about, mm, maybe about 12, 13 on there that you can have a look at if you want to. Um, but I'll move forward to some of the other key achievements that we've had. So we hosted our first um, birth time documentary screening, which was a really big deal. Um, I am going to say I'm very human about life. I'm a mum. I run this organization and as everyone has loads of uh, competing priorities, I also work clinically. So for me, it's uh, always hard to find the time to do these sorts of things. So this was my first step into wanting to start doing um, community engagement in person. So it was very su successful. We had about 45 tickets sell and lots of people came from different backgrounds and different communities. And it was such a lovely space to share just to talk about birth and reflect on what's actually happening in our current you know, maternity care systems. So that was a real uh, win for me that day. In the last year, we've had about 105 mums connect with Rahan Project and we've linked about 25% of them, so a quarter of them to relevant further support, which I think is um, again, another win for us. Regarding our advocacy, one of the things I've started noticing more and more over the last couple of months is, there are mothers, and these are some of the examples that we shared where we supported them, who are in patients in maternity units. And this is all over the UK, actually. Um, so not necessarily down to just one area, but they're in patients, yet they are calling us for information. And could you just explain what this word means? Or could you just, you know, go through what this might mean? And actually... I feel like we must be failing people if they are under the roof of a maternity care system and they're having to come speak to people outside of that to find information when they've got skilled professionals all around them. So I hope that just gets people to reflect and I know it's really busy and I know it's really hard. Um, just pause and sometimes just, you know, engage in a conversation, just take that little bit longer, just to make sure people have um, asked all the questions that they want to ask and 
give them the space to guide the conversation as well as opposed to leading it how you need to as a healthcare professional. And last but not least, our other achievements. These are all of the other kind of organizations that we've ended up linking with and uh, doing a bit of work with. We were nominated for two awards, which we're very proud of, and we were shortlisted and runners up for each of them um, in our first year of existence. So I feel like this is, you know, just the start of what we've been doing. Mm. And I'm hoping we're going to move forward and uh, create real, you know, cultural change in our local maternity area. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you for listening, Sue. I think that's quite a lot to say, Faisa. <laughs> Sue, it's been a really busy year. <laughs> yes, I can, I can kind of see that. I can see that. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting that the work that you've done and the kind of the, the links you've got with the Ockenden and what we do and, and some things that were for me quite uncomfortable to hear when mm. I hear about a midwife sniggering about a woman it, that that's quite uncomfortable um, mm. but it's important for us to know that's happening uh, and try and treat it sort of non-judgmentally but but it's quite uh, quite difficult because you kind of feel for the poor woman who is in that situation who, who can't really speak up for herself at the particular time Absolutely. I definitely feel that um, it's been a real uh, learning curve for me because my instinct is to want to protect midwifery because I am a midwife. Mm. But actually, I have to step back and I need to really listen. And if I want to really create change, I need to listen to everybody. So I recognise midwives are struggling and I recognise that families are not getting what they need. Mm. So it, it's just about bringing those two units together, I think. That's mm. the foundation. And then looking at how we can, you know, create other better relations mm. in all the other teams yeah that, I mean that's really that's really in, helpful because I think that that really mm. makes it the non-judgmental and makes it the sort of supportive for both midwives and other workers within the service as well as women and their families mm. that's really that's really helpful now I've got a question that's just flick through before I can get to my questions and it's Lola hi Lola She's an old friend of ours, and she says the sad truth is that anyone can train to be a midwife, but not everyone can be compassionate. We need to work hard on training and recruiting compassionate and caring human beings. OK, I'm not sure that that's not a question, Lola. That was a kind of comment. Um, and that's true. It's, it's kind of one of those very difficult things. How do you when you're um, recruiting or um you're doing your interviews how do you assess someone who's going to be compassionate and caring you kind of expect people who want to come in to be so and I wonder if it's not so much the people that are coming in but what the system does to people I wonder if that's more about mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. I and mean, I was wondering about the and this is I've got my go because there's not the questions will take a little while to come in I was wondering about um the issues of cultural awareness, because that little case study you you suggested, Pfizer, kind of made me think, well, do people understand about the hijab, for example, and do they understand about the, the kind of um, modesty issue? And how do you how do you then feed that back into the system, though you work, you're presumably working mm. at the same you trust? Yeah. How does that work? I mean, one of the things that we've started doing is um, we started working with the East of England Local Governance Authority who have created mm. um, these packages of cultural awareness workshops and they've mm. covered, they've got specialists from each different community because there's so many variations in our communities okay. to come and speak about their own community and explain kind of uh, how their culture works, why things are important for them. And they've opened this up to um, staff to come and join. So we'll be actually doing one at the end of this month um, okay. on the 25th of April um, about the South Asian community. So if people want to come, you just have to Google it and I'm sure the link will come up. It's a free event, but it's small things like this, Sue, starting to have these kind of conversations. I do believe one thing that needs to happen regarding cultural awareness training is I think it needs to become mandatory and streamlined so that every area is you know using experts from their those fields rather than 
you know, somebody who doesn't necessarily um, relate to the communities teaching something because it's not the same you need to sit and you need to hear it from people who are from mm. the community to really understand it I think mm. I mean it's a little it's a little bit like the um years ago they had the, the I think it was the nursing times did bereavement books and they had for each religion or ethnic group they had a book mm. and you could go through it but of course what you had to know and once you knew when you talked to women is yeah. that people have their own culture which isn't necessarily as delineated as you'd see in a book Absolutely. and that's what I think you've illustrated brilliantly that's fantastic Absolutely. and also just one addition to that also Sue is this that really if everyone had the I'm going to say the capacity and the time because I know that's a real issue mm. but if everyone just stopped and actually just listened and talked to families they pick up these variations mm. and if they built relationships with people right from the beginning they would pick up all of these things that are very very important to families as opposed to you know meeting a stranger and then having to explain why you're doing what you're doing and then feeling a bit silly about it um mm. because People can absolutely ask us questions. They cannot, we can all ask each other questions. It's how we go about it. You can compassionately ask us questions. The tone is very important. <laughs> mm. Yeah, not why do you, why do you have to do it like that? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And you know, one of the common one is, um, and I, I hear this all the time, isn't it a bit weird that you're married to your cousin? And I always think in my head, oh, pause, pause. <laughs> I think before you just said that because the way you said it, you've judged them. Count to 20. <laughs> Count to 20. And then just, you know, ask them, but ask in a way where you're yeah. being open to the fact that that's the practice that they choose to have. Yeah. And I think that's what Maddie was talking about earlier about not having the time to talk to each other as midwives, for example, or as, as a team of having that time to, to kind of talk about this sort of stuff that, you know, you when someone... I don't know when they share some sort of food or, or or experience if you've got time you'll chat about it won't you and you'll find out you learn almost without having to learn I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that Maddie yeah I think I when you were talking about um the comment that came out came through about being compassionate I mm. I genuinely think it is something you can teach you know, the psychologists talk about soft skills. And I think those skills are ones that are not uh, given as much priority mm. in clinicians' um, curriculums when, when you're being trained. Mm. Um, and I know that doulas, we have the luxury of being able to spend a lot of time mm. um, learning listening skills learning how to communicate in a compassionate way without judgment um but I do think that more of that could be more emphasis could be put in the curriculum on those on those kinds of skills because mm. it's about um fostering curiosity mm. being genuinely um interested in the people mm. that you're caring for um, and having an unconditional positive regard mm. for for everyone um, and yeah you ab absolutely can teach that I, I teach doulas that stuff all the time I think we're going to get quite a, a few questions in shortly from because there'll be teachers watching um, and <laughs> absolutely get this in the curriculum um, at the moment there's a lot of very people thinking this is a really helpful session really enjoyed it so I can have another question the, the, one of the things I was wondering you had the little table Pfizer of when a woman had an issue and then she was helped with whatever given information or pointed in the right direction is there a way that then that gets fed back kind of um it's probably because i'm reading this report but does it get fed back in writing to the head of midwifery or to the um into the service so that somewhere it's recorded yeah so what we do is um we will link them with pals and anyone who we can find okay. within the service who is a lead ideally i try to link them to a head of midwifery and then I allowed them to figure out where they where they wish to disseminate and who the service, who they want to connect back to this family, um, because actually that is the onus has to be on them, you know, 
the onus has to be that there's a responsibility of care that you are giving to people and that you need to step up to that um so i think uh, that's how i feel is the best way to do it and also with raham project i am absolutely a midwife but i bring my i'm a mother first and i'm you know lots of other people before i bring a midwife to that platform and although the midwifery helps me underpin so much of the knowledge i can't apply my clinical skills like give people advice because I'm not legally covered to do that mm. so I don't step over that mark but I completely can give people information that they should have access to that anybody can give them mm. which means that gives that puts them in a better position to know what they really should be deserving of actually mm. well, so, I mean that's interesting the sort of uh, parameters of practice and I think Maddie was talking about that a bit earlier right at the beginning of the session when she was saying sometimes or what I was hearing about the tension, potential tension with some midwives and some doulas, where there's a feeling that either the maddie, the the, the, the maddie, yeah. <laughs> the doula, the doula's getting a better job because she can do the things we'd like to do, maybe. Um, but I know I have heard of, of some midwives feeling quite uncomfortable because they feel as though the doula might tread on their toes. Mm. And I don't know yeah. if you've experienced that or... Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, less less these days, I think, than maybe many years ago because there's more of an understanding maybe of what our role encompasses and more of us doulas around, so more midwives have worked with us um, and often will go into a birth room and perhaps encounter suspicion or a chilly reception. But by the end... You know, the baby's born, we're hugging each other and we're best pals. Mm. Um, so there's, you know, there's more of that going on. But um, I do often sort of get this, encounter this idea that maybe in some kind of um, utopian future, when midwifery and maternity care is all sorted, uh, oh. that we won't need <laughs> to do this anymore. And that always kind of interests me that mm. feeling because um the roles are very you know in an ideal world we'll be complementary mm. to you mm. you know this isn't about us doing things that midwives should be doing mm. or eroding your role I, I'll always ask well can can a birthing family have too much love that is just not possible, is it? <laughs> you know, we we are making this beautiful circle around them, giving them all the love and care they they need. And mm. um, even with the best will in the world, a midwife is not going to be able to spend all day with a new family doing mm. their hoovering and making them tea sandwiches. You know that wow. that's definitely a doula. That, <laughs> Maddie, that was the complete service. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I Maddie, can, I, can I just say um, I love working with doulas um, because if we're all there for the same reason which is the family there is no competing we're all there for oh. the same common goal so I th I love working with doulas uh, I just want to throw yeah. that out there and also I think doulas have always existed so for yeah. example mm. people have their aunts their sisters and you got the support network from from there didn't you mm. so I guess this is um, right. us finding a way within the society that we mm. live in to make sure that people still get that that nurturing and love and support and That's in right. all fairness the way I would defend my sisters and my brothers and my mum and my dad you know that's what a doula would do for you mm. for you and I yeah, think that's we, that's a wonderful yeah. that is a wonderful kind of way of seeing it because I, and I was reading a bit of history um earlier this week talking about the gossips in the old days mm -hmm. but when it was women's business childbirth was women's business so thank you Jeanette Alotti for this and you'd have the um the gossips who used to be the friends sisters cousins who used to come mm -hmm. in the men were out of it at that point <laughs> it was all the women women's business just interesting you've kind of triggered that thing thinking my me Pfizer now I've got <laughs> um, a query uh, Sue Broughton, hi Sue, says culture, race, religion, sexuality, gender identity, whoa, are not given enough thought in midwifery care. I assume it's not discussed enough in midwifery and medical training. Mm. I'm not sure about that. 
because I think mm. as a teacher I think it is mm. but it depends I mean the, the, my my understanding is the curriculum the program is really full and probably Pfizer will remember that better than I will because she's been through it <laughs> nearer <laughs> than I have <laughs> but there's a lot to put in it and these sort of things you you don't just learn in the program but you learn on the, on the ground with your midwives mm. I guess mm. I think one thing you get as a student is you get the luxury to be able to really spend one-to-one -one time with people. So a lot of mm. families actually come away really liking when they have, say, a really experienced third-year student who can give them mm. that real emotional support, that mm. really holistic support. So actually, I think um, you come away and pick up a lot of that. I think the difficulty comes when you start having to face the challenges of the intensity of mm. the service, how yeah. do you continue to be kind and compassionate when you're not getting a moment to breathe? Mm. So it's really difficult, if I'm completely honest with you, mm. it's only become more and more harder, I think, for most people. Mm. And I don't excuse poor care. I don't think it's ever acceptable. Mm. I completely recognize what's happening in the system that is not allowing people to be kind. I think, you know, when we talk about incivility, it kills people. We need people who are kinder and more compassionate. But in order to do that, we need to fill their cups as well because they are only humans. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree, Pfizer. I think it's, it's much harder to make a human connection with somebody when you're only seeing them at this one point in their maternity care mm. and then they're gone. It, whereas, you know, doulas, for example, we're in their house we're seeing how their family dynamics play out and their and their mm. culture, their traditions, mm. their ceremonies. We're, we're there. We're so lucky mm. to be able to witness this stuff and learn from our mm. clients and then take that learning forward into different families and to have such a diverse client base. Mm. Um, so it's really it is really hard for midwives and mm. you know I hate to say it but you know, continuity would <laughs> completely make you like continuity <laughs> but wouldn't it make a difference because then you would have that chance to really walk that yeah. whole journey through with the family and not only understand really intimately why they want what they want why mm. they feel the way they feel but learn all about their cultural and social context mm. I think also in addition to that Maddie the thing that would come out of that is we would support people's choices better mm. yeah. because you would feel more confident as you know the family to stand mm. up and be like no they definitely would not want this actually you know we've mm. discussed this yeah. in depth it's really difficult um, uh, to always stand up for people if you've only met them for a couple of minutes mm. and there's like fear of malpractice hanging on everybody's Absolutely. head. Absolutely. This is this like a, a like a bogeyman that well, exists. Well, yeah, early. absolutely. And I think I think the issue as well. I think we've dealt with a lot of continuity over the last few weeks, and I know that it, there's this whole thing. If you haven't got enough staff, you can't provide continuity so it's a sort of it's a vicious circle really because if you've got enough staff you can do continuity models and it it actually adds to the the quality for the midwife as well as as women and their families and their babies I'm yeah. we're, I'm going to allow I've got a comment and I have to allow this comment because this is from Jenny Hall hello Jenny and happy birthday for tomorrow that's why <laughs> our editor for Matflix and she says, I agree about the so-called soft skills, but these are essential. They're always used, they always used to be in curricula, but over time, with more students have to learn, there has been less emphasis. So focus must be shifted back. So thank you for that, that very, Jenny. That's fantastic. And then Juliet, Juliet Samuel, hi, Juliet, says it's the realisation that it's not one cap fits all. And yeah. I think involving the local community during training will facilitate orientation in the diversity and richness of our community, which will allow focus for individualised care. We've got lots that we've got one. Anna Neal from Canada saying wonderful to listen. She's on holiday in Canada. <laughs> and Deepa. Hi, Deepa. Um, and 
she must be coming to the end of her training now. Where can I start in bringing more awareness about understanding culture of minority ethnic women and cultures? I'm training in a place that has begun to see a cluster of South Asian families, but there are a lot of assumptions about them. Deeper, you need to get connected with Pfizer. Go and have a look at that Facebook page and get connected with Pfizer. Now, I knew, I knew, I knew. And I said to Pfizer and Maddie, this hour is going to go quickly. And it has flown <laughs> by. Now, I can promise that we'll have Pfizer and Maddie back because they're fantastic, aren't they? Aren't they fantastic? Thank you. <laughs> and it's so many things to think about and such warmth compassion and care from both of them for midwives as well as for women and babies and families so thank you so much Pfizer and Maddie you've been fantastic and we have to we have to be finishing now so I'm just reminding people that these the the resources that they're online this will be available as a little um, podcast and it also be available after tonight don't forget that we're having a little holiday from the maternity and midwifery hour. So I've sent you your homework. You have to start looking at the Ockenden report. Have a look at some of the Matflix other videos because there's loads there to keep you busy for a couple of weeks till we're back. We've got the Midlands Maternity and Midwifery Festival on the 26th of April in Birmingham. So you, if you haven't booked, book up for that. We've got Manchester on the 21st of June. So if you want to put a paper in, put a paper in because we're looking forward to that. And in the meantime, oh, I needed to just flag up because I love this too. This oh, is the oh, sort good. of thing Pfizer's been doing. And this is in this is going to be in May's midwifery because we love it. Thank and it's you. fantastic. Put it in your rooms to show women, share it with women. It's got all the information you need and the women will need. It's lovely. And it's so contemporary and colourful. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So without much further ado, a big thank you to Pfizer and Maddie again. Thank you to all of you. In the meantime, look after yourselves, stay safe and just care for yourselves. See you next, not next week after that. <laughs> the Maternity and Midwifery Forum brings you Matflix, video streaming from maternity experts. All your CPD and revalidation needs met in one place. Our expertly curated box sets are the perfect way to engage with the latest thinking, issue by issue. They make revalidation easy and are the perfect accompaniment to any project or university coursework. In addition to video from expert speakers across maternity and midwifery, there is easily accessible research and links to the latest government policy documents. Our reflective questions at the end are the perfect primer for your revalidation. In the same way the Maternity and Midwifery Forum provides certificates to show that you have attended these festivals, we can provide certificates for those who have consumed the content of a box set and submitted their written answers to the reflective questions provided by our curator, Dr Jenny Hall. Midwives, maternity professionals and students, do not miss out. Subscribe to Matflix today. Box sets are now available via Open Athens and other international federated access with library institutional subscriptions packages at £1,950 a year. Individual subscriptions are also available at £8.99 a month and just £4.99 a month for students. Check out the box sets at www.matflix.co.uk One of the benefits, I think, of, of a platform like this is that if you are busy clinically or if you can't watch or listen or engage um, real time, you can do this at other times. So that is fabulous for such a time as this. So delighted to be with you all, albeit virtually um, on the screen. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Dunkley bent I'm the Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England. So this is what's called a hybrid event. There are people in the room, there are people watching in groups around the country, and there are people still watching in their pajamas at home. Good morning, Sue, how are you? 
Good morning. I'm fine, Neil. Thank you very much. It's fantastic okay. to be here. My argument is that the solution is health optimization. Prevention is far better than cure. And I think there is a real risk that services that are lost or reduced during the time of COVID are not restored. And I hope that you can take valuable insights from today. And if you're listening tonight or if you're listening next week or next month, take valuable insights from the speakers from today and share the word, share the positive messages with your colleagues. Because in these dark times, in these challenging times, everybody needs a green shoot and a pearl of wisdom. Thank you very much. And um, we are in this together. We stand united together.